This is going to be called the Inspector Baptist. What about the Fruit Inspector? The person who teaches Lordship salvation or a changed life is required for one's salvation. Number one. The Inspector Baptist knows he can't do anything to deserve a perfect salvation, but thinks his own works are good enough to prove it. The only works that have anything to do with our salvation was the works Jesus Christ did when he fulfilled all righteousness and his finished work on the cross. Those works were applied to your record when it comes to your salvation. And if you're saved by works, then... That would be the only works that does it, and you didn't even accomplish them yourself. Jesus did. Your own good works don't even come into consideration when it comes to your salvation. It's all work that was done by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's on your record when it comes to your eternal salvation. Your own personal works, your own personal righteousness, that's a separate issue than your salvation that is about discipleship. There's a difference between salvation and discipleship. The Bible is so clear. And most of the people that listen to me, I, I don't even have to tell them this, but a lot of people simply don't understand. Romans 4, 5, and 6. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man in whom God imputeth righteousness, Without works, God gave me the righteousness of Jesus Christ at salvation. When you doubt your salvation, you shouldn't remind yourself about good works you have accomplished to reassure yourself that you're saved. And you shouldn't remind yourself about bad works you've committed to make you think that you're not saved. You should look at the time when you believed the gospel from the heart. But the Inspector Baptist causes people to look to their works to determine, did I truly get saved? And that may not be their intention, but that's what happens when a preacher consistently teaches the people, you're not saved if you did this. You're not saved if you do that. If you're not consistently showing your faith by your works, then you really didn't get saved. The more he teaches that, the more that person will look towards their works as the determining factor instead of that moment when they believe the gospel. In Acts 26, 20, Paul said that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. I am nowhere denying that a Christian should have good works. He, of course he should have good works. We should do works meet for repentance, works that would, would match what we believe. I mean, no one is encouraging people to go live like the devil. However, doing good works meet for repentance are done for the sake of somebody's testimony, not to prove salvation. I mean, I don't, I don't do good works to prove my salvation to people. I do it because the Bible says to, and I, I believe God wants me to do right, and I feel, I feel guilty and wicked before God if I don't do what he would, would have me to do according to the Bible. It's not to prove salvation. It's for my testimony. I don't want people thinking that that I don't live like I profess to believe. I don't want people seeing me read the Bible and then, and then going out and cussing and fornicating and drinking. I'm all about cleaning up your life and getting it as close to perfection as it can be. I'm just not for telling people Remember that if you drink, you probably didn't really get saved. Or if you're living living with your girlfriend, you probably really didn't get saved. I don't do all that. I don't say all that stuff because that stuff is about discipleship. It's not about salvation. I should do works that match what a Christian should do. However, that doesn't mean that I always am doing good works that match what a Christian should do. Whether an inspector or Baptist knows it or not, he is consistently living in self-righteousness if he thinks that he's living a good enough life to prove a perfect salvation. There's always somebody that lives better. There's always somebody with a higher standard. So they may look at you and say, oh, he's doing that. I don't agree with it. I don't know if a safe person could really do that or not. I mean, you could have everything in your life just perfect, but then maybe you use Facebook or something, 
and somebody will say, if you use Facebook, you're a, you're in sin. I don't see how a Christian could get on an un, 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 ungodly social media like that and still claim to be a Christian. I've heard a people preachers say that. They say, if you have Facebook, you're in sin. So if that's true, if, if you have Facebook and that's a sin, then you do have a sinful lifestyle, according to him. And if he was somebody that was an inspector Baptist looking for a changed life or a lifestyle that was pleasing to God in order to prove salvation, he would say that you're lost. Even though you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't fornicate, you don't do all these other sins, but since you got that sin, then you're lost according to him. And see, that's the problem is, eventually the person's going to place their own convictions on there and he's going to start saying people's not saved because they're not meeting his own standards. You see, when you teach a change life is required, you start putting your own standards in there. Now, the next thing, the inspector Baptist can't remember to rightly divide the flesh from the spirit when it comes to us being a new creature. In 2 Corinthians five seventeen and 18, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled to us himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So when it comes to the new creature, old things are passed away, all things are become new, and all things are of God. This is highly abused, these verses here. Very abused. I've heard it a thousand times, not just by preachers, but by Christians, that they abuse these verses. The inspector Baptist will examine your life and tell you that a genuine Christian wouldn't do what you're doing because a true Christian is a new creature and there's no way that he would do what you're doing. That's what he would say. Although he doesn't claim any Christian is sinless, he would almost he almost has to teach that a Christian is sinless to use the term new creature in the way that he's using it. If he's consistent, you would have to teach that someone's sinless. Look at the context of new creature. It says old things are passed away. It says all things are become new. And then in the next verse, in verse 18, it says, and all things are of God. So if new creature means that a person's going to live a changed life, he's going to have to have everything change, not just his pet sins. It's going to have to be all of it. It said all things are of God. All things are become new. Old things are passed away. If that's referring to a Christian should have a changed life after salvation or he really didn't get saved, to be consistent, you're going to have to teach sinless perfection just like the holiness. If a new creature meant a person was incapable of living an ungodly lifestyle after salvation, then it would have to mean it was a sinlessly perfect lifestyle. It says, old things are passed away, all things are become new. Then the next verse says, and all things are of God. But the new creature has nothing to do with the flesh. And even though most inspector Baptists understand standing verses state, they know all about it. They know all about how you got two natures. They know all about the old man and the new man. But when they get to this verse, they forget for some reason that the new creature has to do with the spirit, the inner man. The inner man is what's born of God. The inner man is the one that doesn't sin. First John 3, 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his, his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The new creature, your inner man, doesn't sin. That's what's born of God. See, the holiness crowd would love to take you to First John 3, 9 and say, See, if you're born of God, you don't commit sin, and you cannot sin. And therefore, if you sin, then you're really not saved or something like that. But the holiness crowd do not understand your two natures at all. They don't understand the flesh versus the spirit. And for some reason, the inspector Baptist, when he gets to 2 Corinthians five seventeen and 18, he forgets about all this stuff too. But see, it's the new man, the new creature, your inner man does not sin. However, you still have the battle with the old man, the flesh. 
and he isn't a new creature at all. He isn't of God at all. He has nothing to do with 2 Corinthians 5.17. So to use 2 Corinthians 5.17 to prove that a, a saved person will show the works that you're looking for, if he's a true, genuine convert, that is messing up those verses and abusing it. And it's also putting people in bondage most times to your standards. You're using those verses to put people in bondage to your standards. I've heard evangelists get up and say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I don't see how you people could miss church, only come on Sunday morning and claim to be saved. I'm thinking, are you serious? When an evangelist wants to get up and teach that garbage like that, I literally want to close my Bible because he has no idea what he's talking about. He does not understand New Testament salvation at all. And he's making... Uh, Somebody think that if they are not in church Sunday night and Wednesday night and every time the doors are open and just glad about it, then he he puts doubt in that person's mind. For one thing, these evangelists come in, they don't even know who the people are, and they want to get up and tell a bunch of people who they don't even know who they are. They, he wants to basically get up and tell all of them that they're lost because they're not meeting his standards. So he puts them in bondage to his standards because all he does is go around from church to church and he's in this bubble and he sits in his RV or his car driving from place to place listening to camp meeting preaching and he must forget what the real world is like. Most Christians get up every morning. They go to a factory job. A good portion of them work second shift so they can't be there on Sunday night. They can't be there on Wednesday night. And it's like he for, he thinks everybody's like him. He's lost touch with reality a little bit. And he wants to abuse these verses to make his to put his convictions on everybody else and make them and convince them that they're lost if they don't meet those standards and convictions that he has. But Paul, the apostle Paul said himself, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul called himself a wretch and the chief of sinners. He recognized that he still had sinful flesh. He recognized that he could choose to walk in the flesh or to walk in the spirit. The inspector Baptist has a hard time distinguishing between the two when it gets to 2 Corinthians 5.17. But other times... He'll flat out tell you. He says, I know that I'm a sinner. He'll tell you that I, I fail God every day. There's times where he, he gets it right. But then when he gets to verses like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when he gets in a mood to where he wants to guilt people into doing certain things, he starts with the inspector Baptist stuff. And it, it, it always results in hypocrisy. It always re results in talking out of both sides of your mouth it results in just double speak. You see, when you're teaching something as inconsistent as this, you're going to find yourself contradicting yourself over and over and over again. One minute you're going to be saying that you can't have a sinful lifestyle and be saved. The next minute you're going to be saying that a, a Christian could go back and commit the sins he did as a lost person. It just depends on what you're trying to get across. And you're using it whichever way is the most convenient for you. That's the, one of the dangers of this teaching is it's very inconsistent. It results in double speak. The next thing, he has to thank every Christian if he's consistent, if the inspector Baptist is consistent when it comes to 2 Corinthians 5.17 and what he claims it to believe. If he believes that every Christian will have a changed life, then he must think Every Christian will be highly decorated at the judgment seat of Christ and get an MVP award and the Hall of Fame and everything at the judgment seat of Christ if he's consistent. If every Christian that gets born again will turn out living a godly, separated lifestyle and not in an ungodly lifestyle, then would everyone at the judgment seat of Christ get crowns, gold, precious stones, and inheritance? 
millennial and millennial inheritance when he gets to the judgment seat of Christ. Why does he warn about warn Christians about not getting anything when they get to the judgment seat? Why does he warn them about their works being burned up? And why does he say in Second Timothy two twelve, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. He says, if we suffer. Notice Paul's use of the word if, showing that it is possible for a Christian not to suffer for the Lord. The truth is there are plenty of Christians who are truly born again, who do absolutely jack diddly squat nothing for God and will end up with nothing at the judgment seat. Doing absolutely nothing for God is an ungodly lifestyle. Just like someone who lives in fornication has an ungodly lifestyle, the person doing absolutely nothing but existing as a saved person is living an ungodly lifestyle because he's living a, a life of just living for himself. So to be consistent, if you're teaching that a changed life is required for salvation, if you're teaching that works have to be there, then you're going to think every Christian will be a Hall of Famer at the judgment seat. Even if he doesn't, even if he, uh, even if you know, it's like a lot of times they know about the standing versus state. They know that there's a difference between the flesh and the spirit. But yet they want to say that every Christian's going to have the works. So if you're going to be consistent, then you have to say everybody at the judgment seat is going to rack up. But the inspector, Baptist, forgets that Christians have a choice to choose between righteousness or unrighteousness. There is a choice. For every everything you do, you have a choice. When you get up in the morning, you have a choice. Are you going to do something for God today or are you going to live for the flesh today? When there's an opportunity to sin, you have a choice. Am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? God doesn't force you to do it. The new man in you does not force you to do it. In Romans 8, 12, and 13, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Paul warns Christians that if they live after the flesh, they will die. But I thought a Christian had to have a changed life or he wasn't truly saved, according to the Inspector Baptist. This, this verse proves he has a choice. He has a choice to live for the flesh and die, maybe cut his life short, or to mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit and live. The Calvinist teaches perseverance of the saints. He teaches a person who is truly elect would not live like a lost person. Now, the Inspector Baptist will be very against Calvinism, which I am too, but he teaches something similar. He teaches that if a person doesn't have the works, then he really isn't saved, which is perseverance of the saints. The Calvinist teaches if somebody's really elect, he'll have the works, Whereas the Inspector Baptist teaches that if a person is really saved, he will have the works. God doesn't make you live right. It's a choice. A Christian has a choice, and if he makes the wrong choices, it doesn't mean he's lost. It means he makes bad choices. It means he isn't walking in the Spirit. It means he's choosing to live for the flesh. The next thing, the Inspector Baptist is always worried about the, you know, like the the new IFB and Jack Hiles and all those guys, they're always talking about how they just would do these one, two, three, repeat after me prayers. And they had all of these uh, professions, thousands of professions every week. And they're so worried about that, that um, they, they start calling it easy believism, empty believism. And I'm, I'm completely aware that people lie about their salvation. They'll pray a prayer and lie and say that they got saved when they really don't even know what salvation is. I mean, I'm completely aware of that. Salvation can be lied about, but fruit can also be counterfeited. The Inspector Baptist doesn't say stuff about that. The Inspector Baptist is all about 
calling out false converts and saying someone really didn't get saved. They're all about saying someone is lying about their salvation. Obviously, a person can lie about being saved. They can lie and say they believe from the heart when all they did was pray a prayer to get rid of a soul winner. I mean, I'm not stupid. I know people do that. But at the same time, the fruit that the inspector is searching for can also be counterfeited. It could be turning over a new leaf. It can be a lost person that realizes his sin is destroying his life and he's quitting the sin because of that reason. At the same time, he may never have even believed the gospel. He can claim to have, to understand it and to, and to have gotten saved and then he's turning over a new leaf because he realizes that sin is destroying his life. But the inspector Baptist will continually say if a Christian is truly saved, he won't commit adultery. He won't have a lifestyle of drunkenness. He won't have this lifestyle. You cause the people to look at their works to determine their salvation instead of looking at the moment they believed the gospel to determine their salvation. Just like a works-based salvationist is focused on his works to get saved or stay saved, the inspector Baptist causes men to focus on the works of the flesh to prove to themselves and to other people that they are saved. This leads to bondage because you're going to eventually have to meet certain standards and convictions that they have that aren't even in the Bible. While we should do works meet for repentance, while we should maintain good works, while we should turn to God from idols, we will always fall short somewhere. And if I'm focusing on my works to prove I've truly believed, then I'll be looking at my own righteousness instead of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I haven't always made the right choice, but Jesus did. I didn't all, do all the law perfectly, but Jesus did. He had all the works needed to be saved by works. Then he offered himself on the cross so that he could offer his righteousness to me as a free gift. I couldn't do it. I couldn't uh, live a good enough, enough life to deserve salvation. I can't live a good enough life after salvation to deserve to keep it. I really can't even do a good enough life to prove it, to prove that I have a perfect salvation, even though that I should maintain good works. And I should do works that the the Bible says to do. The only works that saves are the ones Jesus Christ put on my record when he gave me perfect salvation. The greatest Christian who ever lived has never done enough good to prove a perfect salvation. He's failed. The next thing, how much fruit should a person have before you know they are truly saved? That was a an inspector Baptist had an article where he talked about, he was asked the question, how much fruit should a person have before I know they are truly saved? And I heard this pastor say that he looks for a sign of spiritual life that he hasn't seen before in the person. For example, an interest in getting baptized, a Bible question, and so on and so forth, which those aren't hard signs to come by. But if you're, if those are the type of signs that you're looking for to determine if that person is truly born again. That is a very inaccurate and, and, and inconsistent way to tell if a person truly got saved. It's kind of mind-blowing that that person is looking for that kind of stuff to determine if somebody's really saved or not. If I want to know if a person is saved, then I ask them, have you ever been saved? And a lot of people say yes when they really didn't. So I ask them, in your opinion, what does a person do to get saved? And if they say something along the lines of realize, they realize they were a sinner and they believed the gospel, then they're correct. So I'll say, did you do that? And they say, yes. And that is my confirmation on if they are truly saved. I believe the word of their testimony. I'm not looking for any other sign to determine whether or not they are saved. Now... I look for signs and whether or not I want a company with this person. For example, that person could say that they're saved, yet they live like a lost person. So I shouldn't hang out with that person. Because Paul tells us there are some Christians we shouldn't even company with. You see, I'm not lowering any standards to teach what I'm teaching. I'm not saying that a person should just go live like they want to. 
that's crazy. But I'm also not using a person's lifestyle to determine for me if they're saved or not. That's a very inconsistent way to determine someone's salvation. I look for signs to determine if they are growing as a Christian. But not all safe people grow in their Christian walk. It's not to determine if they're saved or lost. I'd have to see every aspect of their life from the time of their profession until they met me. If you go by this, you would have to see their life from the time of their profession and uh, that they claim to be saved. I mean, I know that there was never... was. How do I know that there was never a time when they did show a sign of spiritual life? To the person who believed a changed life is required for salvation, if he saw someone who was living for the flesh as a drunk, he automatically many times will call him lost. How does he know there was never a time when the person was living right or showing a sign of spiritual life, as he calls it? If he saw him when he was living right, then he would say he was saved. If he saw him living as a drunk, then he would say he was lost. You see how this looking at a person's lifestyle to determine if they're saved or not is a very inconsistent way of salvation because there are times in a Christian's life where he's living right. There's times in a Christian's life where he's not living right. Many men who teach change life required for salvation are much older than me. They've been in the Bible longer than me, and they know much more Scripture than I do. And if you saw my study last week about the pride of old and young men, I talked about how I don't like to correct older men. So I don't. I don't like to go against an older man that's been in the Scriptures a long time without a good reason, without a good cause. Many of the people who teach this I respect and I think are way better Christians than I ever could be, no more Bible than I could ever know. But to me, this that they're teaching is very inconsistent teaching on their part. And I believe that it's, it's not good for people to, to hear this type of preaching. And that's why I'm doing this study and that's why I talk about it so much. I believe that this is the Baptist way of getting works into the, in, in there to play a part in someone's salvation even though they say it's not they'll say that it's it doesn't determine someone's salvation it's a result of it it's still putting the work having somebody looking at their works instead of looking to jesus <clears throat> how many times have you seen a person come to your church come up and claim to get saved maybe they did and maybe they didn't then they get baptized they get a king james bible they show interest by coming to services then a few months later, they are back to how they were before they were saved. This happens thousands and thousands of times. I've only been saved for a little over 10 years, and I've seen it tons of times. Now, they, the, the guy who is looking at works would say they were saved because of those first few months. But if a guy up the street who is a fruit inspector who doesn't know the person, who didn't see that change in their life, that he's looking for and it, so he's also looking at their works when he sees the person living for the flesh again he says well this person's obviously lost whereas when he's seen them for the first few months he'd say man that person got saved but if he sees them now living for the flesh he would say i don't care if they say they're saved or not a saved man wouldn't act like that he never saw any of the fruit that the person had in the first few months of being saved. He only sees the person's state that they are currently living in now and says they're lost. So you see how looking at works to determine a person's salvation is a very inconsistent way of determining a person's salvation. And that's the thing. I can't see your heart. I can't see your standing in Christ. I see your state, how you're presently living. I see how you're living in the flesh and the thing is, I don't even see all of that. You could be a great saint of God out in the open and be wicked as the devil in your house. I'm not God. And not only can I not see your heart, I don't even see what you do behind closed doors. So I could look at a person's um, works that he's doing out in the open, and he could have a really good life out in the open and be a pedophile at home. If I go around telling people that they judge someone's salvation by their works, 
then I give people the idea that they must have their own spiritual thermometer to check everybody else's spiritual temperature to determine if they're saved. And then they end up having a whole list of things a person needs to do to prove their salvation. And th they just keep on adding their own personal standards and convictions to it. Any lost person who makes a false profession can turn, turn over a new leaf for a while. They can show an interest in getting baptized. They can show an interest in preaching. I mean, I got baptized and listened to preaching and read the Bible before I was saved. As a young kid, if I said, look at me, I've got the works, then I'd have been judging my own salvation by my own works, and I wasn't even saved. Then there was a day I believed the gospel. I knew I was a sinner, and I believed on Christ to pay for those sins. Today, I read my Bible. I've been baptized. I show interest in the Bible, but I'm not using those things to judge my salvation. I mean, when the devil comes up next to me and says, you're lost, I don't, I don't, look, I don't say, well, devil, look at all I'm doing. Look at all this, this Bible study I'm doing. I don't look at my works. I look back at the moment I realize my guilt of sin and I called on the Lord. That's what determines my salvation. I'm not looking at my present condition, how I'm presently living, to determine if I'm saved or not. If you do that, it's going to be inaccurate. Because when you're living right, you're going to say, well, look at me, I'm saved. A, saved per a lost person wouldn't live like this. And when you're living wrong, you're going to be like, look at me, I'm lost. A, a saved person wouldn't live like this. You see how inaccurate, inconsistent it is to determine if you've truly been born again by what you're doing in the flesh. The people that go around teaching this, it's almost shocking because there's a lot of Bible students, Bible believers, men that know the Bible very well, yet when it comes to this topic, they're so worried about a false, possible false converts. They're so worried about a person living in sin and abusing the grace of God to the point that they want to teach that they're really not saved if they're not living for God. Works can be counterfeited and a Christian may or may not live up to your standard of holiness. That's just all there is to it. The inspector Baptist does not like to use the change of mind definition for repentance. Even if he believes that's the definition of it, he does not like to emphasize that. And they like to say that we don't believe in any type of repentance. I certainly don't do away with repentance. I mean, Acts 20, 21 says, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God wants all to come to repentance. When a person gets saved, they do have a change of mind. The night I got saved, I realized my sin is not good. And that it was going to take me to hell. I realized I couldn't save myself. So it was no longer, if you're a good person, then you're going to heaven. I changed my mind. I knew I was a sinner. I turned to Jesus Christ for salvation. My repentance had nothing to do with me giving up a certain sin. And not all of them teach that it does, but some of them do. And after I got saved, I repented of certain sins. See, salvation or repentance has a part in a safe person's life but it doesn't save them see when you get saved you need to repent of certain sins that you're doing your pet sins but it that has no effect on your salvation it doesn't prove your salvation for example when i got saved i repented of watching ungodly movies of listening to ungodly music of cussing you know, I had a horrible cussing mouth before I was saved. And I've not had a problem with that really since I was saved. Especially nothing like it was before I was saved. So I repented of those things. It, it obviously had nothing to do with my salvation. It didn't affect my salvation one way or the other. It doesn't prove my salvation. The inspector Baptist says that requiring a changed life doesn't add works to salvation because those works aren't to get one saved, but are rather the result of one being saved. And that's not necessarily true. When a Christian does good works, those works might not, might not even be truly good works. 
because they have might have been done with the wrong motive. Uh, the works could have all been done for vain glory. They could have been done for the purpose of looking the part. That is why at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not just about having good works. He's going to try every man's work of what sort it is. What was the motive behind those good works? And if your good works that you're doing aren't with the right motive, technically they're not all that good. Good works aren't necessarily aren't aren't always necessarily the kind that God's looking for. They have to be done with the right motive for Him. It's a choice to get up and live right. The Bible makes it so clear in Romans six eleven through fourteen. It says, "Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin." but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace." So those verses say you must reckon your flesh to be dead. You must get up and realize that you shouldn't serve the flesh. Serve the new man that's alive. And those verses are clearly showing that a person has a choice. The, old, the in Inspector Baptist, when it comes to this point, he'll overlook the fact that Christians consistently choose to yield their members as instruments of unrighteousness instead of instruments of righteousness. They may claim they're just looking for a little, a little change, like a little sign of spiritual life, but really, if they see someone living in sin who is yielding their members as instruments of unrighteousness, they will say that that person is lost without exception. And they say at first that they're just looking for a small sign of spiritual growth. But then they say they assume that that person will keep growing as a Christian. So the inspector Baptist assumes that if a person is truly saved that they're going to grow. If that is the case, then why does Paul have to treat some as babes in Christ? He said in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, And our brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for you, you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? I mean, were the Corinthians lost? Or were they just carnal baby Christians? It, all these people that have these professions of faith, they're not all lost. They're just carnal, baby Christians that walk in, as the natural man. They're not walking with the, as the new man. They're not walking in the spirit. They're, they weren't growing. A Christian can get saved, and if he doesn't consistently stay in the scriptures... Along with other things, he will not grow. And if a Christian isn't growing, then he is living a lifestyle of sin. And those are the sins of omission. He is consistently choosing to do carnal things over spiritual things every day and never doing the things he should be doing to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then he, is, he does have a sinful lifestyle, consistently committing sins of omission. And that is a sinful lifestyle. Even though he's not committing fornication and drink, drinking, he's still living a sinful lifestyle. And that is the majority of Christians. He's still saved if he believed from the heart. But he's not, he's not growing. The inspector Baptist, if he's consistent, would have to believe every Christian is going to grow. The inspector Baptist will also use proof text that does not prove anything. He'll go to James, he'll go to Hebrews, he'll go to Matthew, he'll go to the book of Acts, and he will use verses doctrinally for a, another group of people and put it on us in the, as born-again believers in the church age, just like a person who teaches that you can lose your salvation will do. In any other time, the inspector Baptist is a Bible-believing dispensationalist but when it comes to this topic, he will go to Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, James and pull verses out of there to put on you today to prove 
that you're dead and without faith if you don't have works. He'll say, faith without works is dead. Therefore, if you don't have works, then you really didn't get saved. He'll go to James 2 and everything else. Even though any other time, he's a Bible-believing dispensationalist that knows how to rightly divide. The Inspector Baptist overlooks standing versus state. And some of them know what standing versus state is, as I've said, but they overlook it. They've believed it since before I was born, but they overlook it when it gets to this topic, whether they admit it or not. They say they are taking both things into account. They say if a person is truly standing in Christ, then he will show evidence in his state. Once again... You have to realize that that is only if they yield to the Holy Spirit. If they walk in the Spirit, then they will do, they'll have the fruit of the Spirit. And sometimes you do, and sometimes you do not. Maybe there are times when you are singing in the choir, and the fruit inspector might say, Man, that boy's got the goods. I can tell he loves God. Then he might walk in on you in a temper tantrum with your wife and say, Man... This guy's lost. He can't be saved. There's no way I would talk to my wife that way. It just, I mean, if you are determining someone's salvation by looking at their works, you're going to go from thinking they're lost, they're saved, they're lost, they're saved, back and forth. Why don't you just ask them if they're saved? If they tell you that they realize they're guilty of sin and believe the gospel, then take them at their word. That's all you can do. To determine a person's salvation by their state is very inconsistent. And that shows that he doesn't really understand standing versus state, or else he doesn't want to acknowledge it when it comes to requiring a changed life or salvation. Now, if you want to say that there is something in a person that wants to do right after they are saved, then that's true. Because Paul said in Romans seven twenty two, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. If you want to say that there is a level of shame when it comes to sin that wasn't there before, then that's also true. Romans 6.21, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So there, obviously there's something in you that wants to do right that wasn't there before you were saved. Obviously, there's something there that makes you sh ashamed when you don't do right. That is, if you don't if you don't get a seared conscience. I mean, if you continue in a certain sin, you're gonna get you're gonna just get worse and worse with it, and it's gonna be nothing to you. But when you get saved, there's that shame there, and there's that something in you that does want to do right. If you're saying that, then that's okay. But to say that a, you determine a person's salvation by what they're doing, that's not right. But to say you understand standing versus state, and yet you're looking for signs in the man's state to determine his salvation, that shows you either really don't understand it or you don't believe it. Because the natural man, which is the old man, your sorry state, may stray from one moment to the next. You have to make a conscious decision to put him off every day. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, it is the new man that is created in righteousness and true holiness. That is your new creature, not the flesh, if the flesh was new, then we would all show a changed life outwardly. The fruit inspector will say that no works play a part in salvation. And that's true. Yet he seems to be looking at the saint's works to determine his salvation more than he's looking at the believer's testimony. I'm not responsible for the actions of another Christian. If a Christian acts like the devil, then I, I'll pray that they'll get saved if they're not saved. And that they get right if they are saved. The inspector Baptist would usually be heavily against Calvinism. And yet his changed life requirement for salvation position puts him right in line with the Calvinistic teaching that if a person is truly elect, then his inner man will always produce works outwardly. 
the Calvinist believes that if you're really one of the elect, then you you will show good works. Just like the Inspector Baptist believes, if you're really saved, then you will have good works. See how similar that is? Now, the Inspector Baptist calls what we believe empty believism or easy believism. To use the phrase easy believism as a bad thing is something I've never understood because in 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul talks about the simplicity of the God, uh, simplicity that's in Christ. And I understand that there are people who go around telling people to pray a prayer and then telling them they are saved just because they prayed a prayer. And I understood, I understand they go around from house to house telling people to pray a prayer. I understand that there are people who pray a prayer just to get rid of that person. And then that Christian will go around and say he won 30 people to Jesus that night just because he got them to pray a prayer. I understand that. But this doesn't change the fact that it is easy to believe the gospel. It's just the person really does have to believe from the heart. But it is easy to believe. And if your definition of easy believism is someone praying a prayer without believing from the heart, then sure, that is wrong. But to say something... It, to call what we believe easy believism, that's misleading because we're not saying it's just one, two, three, repeat after me and you're saved. I mean, that would be true if you're believing from the heart. But somebody who's not believing from the heart, they didn't get saved. However, if your definition of easy believism is someone who believes and then doesn't meet your standard of works, then you're wrong. Because you're saying that it's, it's not enough to just believe. But it is enough to just believe. That's the requirement to have your standing in Christ. is to believe on Jesus Christ. Put your trust in Him. And another thing, I don't get the term empty believism. They say you, you believe in empty believism. Well, when you believed on Jesus, what did you bring to Him to persuade Him to save you? Nothing. You came empty-handed because you remember you repented about believing on your own self-righteousness. I mean, all that time you were living as a lost person, you thought, well, I'm good enough to get to heaven. But when you got saved, you realized you were a sinner. You realized that you weren't good enough to, be, to save yourself. You repented about your own goodness and realized you need a Savior. Meaning you realize Jesus is the one that's good enough. And you turn to Jesus Christ, realizing he is the Savior and not yourself. So, I mean, I don't really get the term empty believism. What that means is, you don't think believing the gospel is enough. You think there has to be works that follow, or the person really didn't get it. So once again, you're looking towards someone's works to determine their salvation more than you are the person just believing the gospel. It's like this. If a person comes to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believes the gospel, he's saved. If he yields himself to the Holy Spirit and walks in the Spirit, then he's going to do good. If he doesn't and he works and he lives for the flesh, he's going to do bad works and he's not going to do good. There's a choice and if... It, whatever a person feeds the most, that's what's going to come out. If he feeds the flesh, he's going to do fleshy things. If he feeds the spirit, he's going to do spiritual things. But this has been a study on Inspector Baptist.